Hey there, I'm Pharmacist Ben, and I am so proud and honored to be talking to this gentleman sitting by my side here, Dr. Wallach. I've known him for going on 15 years. I got a tape in the mail, like a lot of folks, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, back in the mid-90s. And then uh, I had the incredible opportunity of getting to see Dr. Wallach, and since then, he never ceases to, me, uh, to amaze me, and I'm really, really excited to get to, uh, not only for me to be getting to talk to him, but also for you guys to get to hear what Dr. Wallach has to say. So uh, with that, Doc Wallach, thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs> good, to, good to see you and good to be here with you. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about how you started. You got a great story about uh, how you started to get involved with, nu with nutrition as a farm boy, how you noticed uh, things with the animals, and how you had a personal connection with nutritional supplementation, how it worked out for you. Well, I'd like to do that, Pharmacist Ben, but I'll tell you what, before we do that, how about you telling um, us a little bit about Pharmacist Ben? About Pharmacist Ben? All right, well, Pharmacist Ben started, uh, started his pharmacy career in 1986, and uh, in pharmacy school, a lot, of, a lot of people don't realize this, but we study a little bit about nutrition, but we study nutrition in terms of how nutrients are medicines, and we study how uh, diseases are deficiency diseases. So this is one of the reasons why I connected with you so well, because this is your message. We're not sick, we're starving. Many of the things that we consider to be diseases, heart disease, diabetes, the things we die from in this country, are really nutritional deficiencies at their core. And what I like to tell people is, at the point of death itself, we don't die of what it says on our death certificate. We die because some tissue system somewhere, some organ system somewhere is not being fed. So we literally die of nutritional deficiencies. And in pharmacy school, I was studying how uh, vitamin A was connected to night uh, vitamin A deficiency was connected to night blindness and vitamin C deficiency is connected to, to uh, circulatory problems. And on the other hand, I was studying how prescription drugs were toxic and how they had side effects. I remember one time we watched a movie on beta blockers. These are drugs that stop the heart from working in order to lower blood pressure. And this was a movie put out by Ayers for their new drug, Indoral, and it was going to revolutionize the, 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 uh, 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 the hypertension business. And I remember the movie was an hour long, 15 minutes about how revolutionary their drug was, and 45 minutes with some guy reading the side effects of the new drug. <laughs> 45 minutes, I'm telling you, reading the side effects. So I got the idea that we got a real big problem in this country in terms of health care. And the more I studied, the more I got into it, the more I realized that if we could just get nutrients in the hands of people, if we could just get people to start taking nutritional supplementation, we could do a lot of good. So I started practicing in my pharmacy using essential fatty acids to help people with their skin, uh, essential fatty acids to help women with their menstrual cramps, uh, B vitamins to help lower blood pressure, and lo and behold, as I'm sure you know, the results were tremendous. So from the get-go almost, I realized as a young pharmacist that we could be using nutritional supplements instead of using medicines and we could be helping a heck of a lot more people and we could be saving a lot of money on top of that. And then when I heard your message, I was all over it. I got that tape in the mail, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, and I was like, who is this guy? And I listened to it and I listened to it and I got to tell you, I stole some of your ideas and I went out and I started talking to folks using some of your ideas. And then uh, one day I was working out in the gym and I met a guy and we were talking. I said, you have to hear this tape, Dead Doctors Don't Lie. I said, oh my God. I know Dr. Wallach, and it turns out that this guy knew uh, our mutual friend Robert, Robert mm -hmm. Snook, and uh, long story short, he took me to one of your talks, I listened to one of your talks, and uh, I, was a, I was a believer and a follower, and that's, that's how I got involved with, uh, that's how I got involved with longevity, and that's how I got involved with you. So uh, in any case, uh, now I want to talk about you, and your story is very interesting, how you started uh, with nutritional supplementation. Now, I started, it was already the 1980s. So it was all, there were already people who were, who were understanding that vitamin C and the B complex and essential fatty acids and minerals were very important. But when you were working with nutrients, you we're talking about the 1940s, vitamins were only really discovered 20 years before by mainstream science. So for you to get on board, you had to be quite the visionary. I wonder if you could maybe tell the tell viewers a little bit about how, what, what went through your synapses to make you realize, hey, there's something out there that we could be using to help take care of what people are considering diseases, people are considering genetics, uh, genetic maladies, people are considering birth defects, but really are nothing more than nutritional deficiencies. Well, it actually started when I was four years old. Uh, I um, had a disease that would be called today Tourette syndrome. They didn't have a name for it back then, but it's Tourette syndrome. 
and I had facial tics and you know, blink my eyes and I'd get a facial cramps and it progressed, it got worse every year. By the time I was nine years old, I'd go into a tetany and fall over and, and um, my friends, my peers, my age uh, group uh, classmates would say I was possessed and they could bump me around and give me a bear hug and cause me to go into this tetany. And so I started complaining to my mom and she took me to an eye doctor for some reason who's an MD eye doctor and they examined me and said, uh, can't find anything wrong with him except he's got very long eyelashes and they're hitting his glasses, curling back and tickling his eyeballs. That's what's setting this off. They thought that was what, mm -hmm. he tried to say that that was causing the tetany. That's right. And so I'm nine years old and I'm not buying it. And I said, no, that can't be my eyelashes tickling my eyeballs. It's, it's, it's too much of a systemic problem. I didn't use the word systemic, but my whole body was affected. So I didn't believe it was just my eyes. So the next morning I went to the library in school and um, uh, I went and found a nurse's health handbook and uh, looked uh, for long eyelashes and eyelid twitches and that kind of stuff and couldn't find anything. So I just went into the index and just started A and I got down to cramps. I said, well, maybe it's a cramp because I was playing sports and uh, at nine years old and I said, well, I've heard of leg cramps and things. And so I... Um, uh, looked it up in the book, Cramps, and said it was a calcium deficiency. Well, before the bus would pick me up to go to school every morning, I would feed our calves we were going to take to the auction uh, this little bag full of alfalfa pellets, but it had a little analysis tag on it, and just, I'd read the analysis tag. It talked about protein and fiber and calcium. And so I went home that day after school, ran right to the barn, started eating these calf pellets. It tastes like sawdust, but hey, I had a problem. I was going to get rid of it. Next morning, I threw the Cheerios out to the chickens. I filled that cereal bowl up with calf pellets, put milk on it. I did it for three days. By the third day, it was gone. Forever. Uh, forever. Wow. And, of course, I've been taking the 90 essential nutrients twice a day since I was nine years old, 64 years. So what went and through so your head as a young boy when you ta you're taking this, these things that are for the calves mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're this movement disorder that must have been traumatic for you as a kid? Well, what went through your head? Uh, this, like a, you thought it was a miracle? Well, I thought it was one of those eureka moments because I, I understood something that doctors didn't. I recognized immediately that doctors didn't know anything about nutrition mm. when I was nine years old. And I don't know if that was a divine appointment or what, but I, I do know that I realized then at nine years of age that doctors really didn't know much about that sort of thing. And I didn't realize that I was going to get into it as a profession, but I knew that I could help myself and I could help my mom and my grandma and that kind of stuff. And so I began to do more reading on nutrition, and I began to mix um, chicken food with the calf pellets and dog food, and I was making my own little meatloaf and things. And, uh, as a nine-year-old boy? As a nine-year-old boy. By the wow. time I was 18, I really had it figured out and uh, went to agricultural school at the University of Missouri. Halfway through ag school, applied for veterinary school, got accepted, finished my ag degree two years into my veterinary degree, actually found the first case of a ma mass die-off from pollution, got it written up in international journals and veterinary journals, and that started my um, path between nutrition and finding an, a, a mass die-off from pollution and actually got written it up. It was the first one in America. Okay, I want to hear about this mass die-off. That sounds interesting. Well, um, halfway through ag school, I applied for veterinary school. I was just as a lark. I figured I'm going to start practicing, so when I graduate ag school, I'll apply and I'll know what I'm doing. Well, because I was working my way through school, feeding the, the university's beef herd and the dairy herd and milking the cows, the herdsmen gave me very good recommendations, and so I got in as a, a sophomore ag student. They said, well, you really don't have to finish ag school if you don't want to, but I wanted to. So by the time I finished ag school, I'm a sophomore veterinary student, and um, now I'm a graduate student. Well, that just so happens in 1962, all the professors took off and left the graduate students in charge of all the services. And of course, the pathology services, farmers would bring in dead animals, you had to find out what they died from and so on. Or you have to look at biopsies from surgery of small animals. Well, there's one day, this farmer brings in 50 lambs and he says, he had 500 lambs die the night before. I said, was anybody else around? He said, no, it was just me. I just, he said, I don't understand it. And so I started doing autopsies on him. As soon as I cut that first lamb open, I knew what it was because the blood that came out onto the wool looked like chocolate milk, which is methemoglobin. Well, it's it's met, 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 met hemoglobin. Met, met hemoglobin. So it's a darkened, it's an oxidized it, hemoglobin, it, a darkened it, hemoglobin? It, it looks exactly like chocolate milk. Wow. Instead of red or purple or black. And um, it's only caused by one thing, and that is nitrate poisoning. It's the only thing that will cause it. So I knew immediately it was a nitrate poisoning thing. So I said, uh, did you use extra fertilizer in your crops? or?" He said, no, I didn't. I said, well, I need a water sample, and I need some, bring it in tomorrow. 
And uh, as I'm finishing the autopsies, every one of these lambs, instead of having thyroid glands the size of a lima bean, one lobe on each side, each one the size of a lima bean, each one was the size of a plum. And when you cut through it, instead of being like a beet, you know, firm and, and crisp, it, when you cut through it, it was like blackberry jam. So it's like rotten and decaying. Yes, yes. And so I knew that he, these lambs, and every one of them had the same problem. These were six-month-old lamb that had two-inch wool. They were beautiful. I put ten of them in my freezer and ate them, right? There nothing wrong with them, except that they had goiter and met, and met hemoglobin. And it turns out that the neighbor had bought some fertilizer, to, to uh, uh, high nitrate fertilizer to get more corn for his bang for his buck, and it was uphill and rained and got down this guy's well. Well, uh, did all the, the chemistry on the water, the feed, the lamb's blood and their liver and everything. And what happened was, why did 500 of them die in one night? And so I figured, okay, it has to do with metabolism and temperature and stuff. Well, it was December, and in Missouri, in December, you can have a day like today. It could be 50 degrees in December in Missouri. And uh, it's been like 42, 50, 36, 38. Well, the night they all died, it was 19 degrees. It just dropped to 19 degrees, and they all died of hypothermia. They, their metabolism was yeah, off. They, they, their thyroid gland wasn't working, so wow. they couldn't maintain their body temperature. 500 lambs died of hypothermia in one night. Wrote that up, got it published in the, the National Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association wow. and also international journals, and I became instantly known as a student worldwide. Awesome. And you're 22 at the time? 22, yeah. That's awesome. So I think it's really important that people understand that you have a lot of uh, great incredible wisdom and intuition when it comes to nutrition and chemistry, but it comes from actually working with the tissue hands-on. Yes. You actually saw what these nutritional deficiencies do to, chem to the tissue, to yes. the organ systems of the body. And yeah. I think people need to recognize this is, not just, this is not just theory and this is not just book learning. This is actually hands-on understanding about what nutrition does to the body in terms of its organ, the, the body's organ structure and the body's cell structure and the body's tissue structure. That's super important. There's not a lot of people out there who are pathologists or have a pathology background and a nutritional background as well. And a physician. And a veterinarian. And a, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's well, right. Well, the thing that... that followed up from that was uh, I was working with Marlon Perkins as a kid you know, during high school and he got me a job doing That's uh, the Wild Kingdom Wild, Wild Kingdom, Kingdom Mutual yeah. of Omaha yeah. Marlon Perkins yep and uh, he got me a job in Africa on the white rhino um, uh, project which had to do with saving the white rhinos this is it was one of those conservation projects and I was able to get 200 of them uh, bring them back to the United States caught them and so if you see a white rhino in a zoo or a wild animal park, it's, a, it's either one that I caught or maybe offspring. Well, because of that paper, Perkins, it was, and this was the time when pollution was being brought to the surface by Silent Spring, you know, the, mo or the movie Rachel Carson. And Rachel Carson, the book and so forth. And he, he was very good. He thought, you know, we have all these animals dying from natural causes in zoos. Maybe pollution has something to do with it. Kind of like the canary in the mine right, concept, right. like the old Welsh coal miners. If the gas has gotten in the mine, the canaries would drop off the perch long before the men would die, and they could run out before they blew so up. So extinct animals were like a canary in the coal mine, or animals that were becoming exactly. extinct. Exactly. Yeah. And so he said, we're wasting this material. We need to have some. And I know a guy, Wallach, because I'd give him copies of that paper on the lambs. Oh, wow. So he pulls me back out of Africa, and he made me the chief pathologist in that project, which combined the services of the Shaw's Botanical Gardens in St. Louis, the zoo, and the biology department at Washington University. And so it was called the Center for the Biology of Natural System. And to make a long story short, over a period of 12 years, I did over 20,000 autopsies and over um, 17,500 were on over 454 species of zoo animals, 3,000 human beings who lived in close proximity to the zoo. And the book that came out of it um, is 1,200 pages. It's in the Smithsonian That's Institute awesome. as a national treasure. Well, uh, they were shipping me all over the place. Well, what, what struck you, what, what hit you the most? 12,000 autopsies, mm -hmm. that's a lot of tissue. 20,000. 20,000 autopsies, mm -hmm. that's a lot of tissue you're yep. looking at. What struck you the most? What was the most, made the, uh, the biggest impression on you from looking at all that tissue? Well, pharmacist bend. Yes. The, the most profound finding, and this was sort of in the summary of, of uh, there was like 75 scientific papers that came out, published in international journals. I mean, this was a big project. National Institutes of Health, $25 million, which is a lot of money back then. It was chump change now, but back then it was a lot of money for a 24-year-old kid, right? And so um, the profound bottom line finding was, and this was published now, 
Every animal and every human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency That's awesome. disease. That's awesome. Pollution so, was kind of a background thing, and in some cases it contributed to it. Um, and that's, those are another long story. But they could have handled the pollution if they were nutritionally that's solid. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. So yeah. now this is 1962. 1962. This is 1962. So, so take us forward because you didn't start to become well known and the dead doctors, don't lie, didn't, didn't hit for another... 1993. Until 1993. So, so take us forward from 1962 through the 60s. What's going through your head as you're seeing that there's this problem with nutritional deficiencies? And, and you must, it must have hit you that, hey, we're not, we're, we got a big problem here. We, well, we knew it was a big problem. And um, when I was in Africa for that two years working on the White Rhino Project, I was still studying nutrition because I wanted to know what elephants were eating, where they were getting their minerals, where they were getting their vitamins. We were testing water and testing the leaves on the trees and the bark that they were eating and so forth, and writing papers from that too and so forth. And <clears throat> when it came back and began to do these autopsies, they would send me, the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation would send me to different facilities because some facilities had whales and some didn't, some facilities had walruses and some had gorillas and didn't. And so they wanted me to do autopsies or draw blood samples or whatever I had to do to get as many species involved in this project. Well, they actually, after um, the time at the St. Louis Zoo, they sent me to the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago because they had whales and they had the Shedd Aquarium with dolphins and and uh, they had the, the uh, Brookfield Zoo and the Lincoln Park Zoo, so the number of species went way up. And uh, I, I was walking into this office, and I'm unpacking, and there's two biologists there who are getting ready to go on an expedition into Alaska to catch some wild uh, Arctic foxes. And I said, oh, that sounds like an interesting project. Why are you doing that? They said, well, we have a, a pair of Arctic foxes here at the zoo, at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, and they must have some terrible gene because Arctic foxes normally have 10 to 12 uh, kits in their litter, and uh, they are only having three to five kits, and they're always born with this birth defect, so they have this terrible genetic problem. So we want to get some wild genes and bring that in and, and reconfigure the genes and so forth. They said, well, tell me about it. And they said, well, five years earlier, you know, the, the babies were born with neural tube defects, and four years earlier, they were born with no limbs. Three years earlier, they were born with no diaphragm, um, so they all suffocated to death. All different things. All though. different things. Yeah. Every year is a different thing. And then the last year, they had cleft palates. And I said, well, it's not genetic because it would be the same birth defect. It would be like the same birth defect day, year after year after year. If it's one year. gene, it would be the same problem. Exactly. So I said, what are you feeding them? Uh, ground up horse meat. And they said, well, are you giving them any vitamins? Minerals? No, because they're meat eaters. We just give them meat. And so I knew what the problem was right away. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what. Since you're the guys are leaving this week, why don't you get them off a display? They're imperfect. I, I played to their beliefs, right? So I said, they're imperfect specimens anyway. Give them to me. Let me kind of work on them and do some tests on them. And they were happy with that. They brought them up there. And when they left, I went to the grocery store and bought some dog food for toy dogs. And I gave it to the foxes. Within a couple of months, they had a normal litter of 12 babies. So I did the thing that a, a good farmer would do. I inbred them, right? I bred the mother to the sons, the father to the daughters, the brothers to the sisters. And um, by doing that, I had 300 foxes very quickly. Right. And then I inbred them, and I inbred them. By the time three years went by, I had over a couple of thousand foxes. They were in healthy. the reptile house, the bird house, the administration healthy building. Healthy foxes. They're all perfectly healthy, yeah. not a single defect in any of them because they're all getting dog food, which is perfect. Well, I think what you're talking about here is so interesting because this is the early, this is the middle 60s now we're talking? This is the early 60s, yeah. Well, today, well, the cutting edge in science and in genetics is not genetics at all, it's epigenetics. Mm. Today, well, the cutting edge in science and in genetics is not genetics at all, it's epigenetics, mm -hmm. correct? So what you were doing 30 years ago was epigenetics. Was epigenetics. Yes. I wonder if you could tell the folks a little bit about the whole idea of epigenetics, what, how epigenetics relates to genetics, and how nutrition relates to epigenetics. Well, you have to appreciate how the medical mind thinks, pharmacist Ben. You know this being right. a pharmacist. And, but for, for our viewers here, <clears throat> the medical mind is that they get a theory, and everything belongs to that theory. For instance, Back in the days of the cavemen, there were witch doctors and shamans. Everything was caused by evil spirits. Right. And then there was alchemists, and it had to do with distillation, turning, and, distillation, yeah, yeah. turning lead into gold, yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff, and sprinkling. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, exactly, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And then it went into spontaneous generation, because they didn't know about germs yet, and they thought that life spontaneously generated from nothing. And then along came Van Leeuwenhoek, the Dutch um, 
um, he was actually a spectacle maker, made eyeglasses, and he invented the microscope. Yeah, but he put two lenses instead of one lens for your right eye, one eyes for your left eye. He put one compound, lens on top of the other. Made a compound lens. Yeah, made a, a compound microscope, and he looked at pond water. He sees all these little animals floating around. He writes it up. Well, Pasteur gets he's he's a um, a guy who's working on wine, trying to keep it from going sour and going to vinegar. That, yeah. And that's what he came he up with pasteurization. Yeast. He was studying yeast. Yeah, he was studying yeast, exactly. And so um, once he learned that it was a living thing, he couldn't see it because he didn't have a microscope. Once he had a microscope, he could see the little, little yeast buds and budding and growing. So Pasteur was a contemporary. Oh, yeah, of Van Leeuwenhoek. Okay. Yep. And um, uh, he immediately knew that spontaneous generation was not the thing. He knew things were caused by these germs. That's where the germ theory right. came from. And then, of course, um, he was the first one to actually practically make vaccines, although there was a, a medical doctor in England by the name of Jenner who was involved. Got a smallpox guy. Exactly. Yeah. And so um, uh, um, when you had Pasteur, uh, he actually had to, he took 25 sheep in the center of Paris. He set up pens, artificial pens or temporary pens. He had 25 sheep that he vaccinated for anthrax. He had 25 sheep he didn't. He gave anthrax to all 50. And the ones that were vaccinated, uh, 24 of them survived, and one died. And the ones that didn't have vaccines, they all died. And so the press was there, and it was uh, everybody agreed that he knew the answer to anthrax. And so the medical system couldn't argue with it because the press had already made it a feat complete, right? And um, then comes along Mendel and Darwin, right? And Darwin's talking about how things evolve in the Galapagos Islands, and he'd see all these different finches, which are really the same species. But they had different colors and different beaks, but they're the same species. And that's because it took a little adaption in each of the different islands to survive, the predators and things. That's where he came up with the theory of evolution, by it's, watching the finches? Well, watching the finches. Uh -huh. That's where he got that idea. And he knew there was something being passed on from one generation because they could, the ones who were successful had some adaption, right? That was the word, adaption. And the ones that couldn't adapt got eaten by the predators. This is the beginnings of the genetics theory. Yeah, There's exactly. something being passed on, some information passed on from parent to offspring. Exactly. And then here's Mendel, who's this monk, right? And he's growing peas, and he's studying peas, which the monks love to eat. And he was studying which he could get the best peas. And he learned that there was something being passed on, that the color of the pea flowers, um, and the, whether they're wrinkled or smooth, or they're big or they're small, and he could pass on these traits. And so he, he talked about threads, and he knew that something was being passed on. He, he literally said threads? Mm hmm He said threads are being passed on. Threads of life are being passed on. Carrying information was his words. Wow. We're talking about in the, early, in the early 1800s, yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and so that was the beginning of the genetic theory. Well, along comes people like uh, Linus Pauling and Watson and Crick, and they were able to um, actually tell you the structure of a chromosome and so forth and double helix and how traits like eye color and skin color and hair color are being passed on and so forth. The Linus gender. Pauling was in on the whole genetic oh, thing as well. Well, he was the first. He was actually the first one. He was actually cheated in my... Um, he should have actually gotten part of that Nobel Prize that Watson and Crick did because he came up with the helix he before the... Oh, yeah. Wow. He proposed that 10 years before they came along. They were just in their 20s, and he proposed it 10 years earlier. Wow. But they were actually able to do it and, and show it. But So he really should have gotten uh, some part of that Nobel Prize, but he didn't. But at any rate... Um, then along comes all the genome thing, right? So I know suddenly now genetics is going to solve everything. Right. They're just every every right. time they have a new theory, it solves everything. Right, 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 right. right. Okay, and of course the genetic theory was fought for a long time, uh, just like the Earth is flat theory was tried to be defended by the holders of that theory, until Columbus came along, who was an ignorant Portuguese um, seaman, right? He said the Earth was not flat. He, he, no, was he's the guy sailing out there. Yeah, he knew yeah, the yeah, Earth yeah. wasn't yeah. flat. And so um, it comes down to perceptions and what you know and so forth. They're, they were limited. So at any rate, um, uh, my revelation, if you will, back when I was nine years old, the diseases could be caused by nutritional deficiency, kind of I, I learned everything I could about nutrition. Of course, in agriculture school, we learned that we could prevent and cure as many as 900 different diseases in animals with nutrition that in medical school they tell them are genetic. 
Did you know that there was a, it was really a nutritional, an epigenetic component, that the nutrition was actually changing the genes? Yes, well, no, we didn't have the word epigenetic Did at you know that nutrition time. was changing the genes, though, that there were, the nutrition, lack of nutrition was affecting the genetics? And now, that's a better word, affecting, okay? They weren't changing the genes. Affecting. Affecting, because the genes are like a factory. The chromosomes are like a factory. Can you build any factory without raw materials or, or parts? No. Uh, without uh, labors and energy? Of course not. No. no. Okay, so the, a, a gene and a chromosome is the same way. It's just a blueprint. Right. A gene and a chromosome is just a blueprint, right. nothing else. So you right. put a gene and a chromosome in a bucket of saline and say, okay, come on, boys, go to work and make something. Ain't nothing happening. Right. You still the gene need... that makes protein, the blueprint is just there to make the protein. You still need the raw materials to make the protein. That's right. Yeah. And so um, we learned in agricultural school that we could prevent and cure every disease you can think of. We can prevent and cure... Um, well, let's see, we can prevent every birth defect, many of them you could cure. Some of them, like cleft palates, a surgical case, right? And uh, for instance, congestive heart failure, the most common cause of heart disease, a death in adults in America, it's, it's a um, deficiency of a single vitamin. In fact, when I went to, the next thing after the foxes in the Brookfield Zoo, the Shedd Aquarium there in uh, Chicago, they called me over and said, hey, we hear you're wanting to do autopsies on some cetaceans, which are whales and dolphins and things. Yeah, they said, well, we got a freshwater dolphin here from the Ganges River in India, just died, and we get 10 or 12 of them every year and by, in the spring, and by the fall, they're all dead. This is pretty typical. Why don't you give us your thoughts of what's happening here? So I go over there and cut that thing open. First thing, I, I knew immediately what it was, because the heart of a 300-pound freshwater dolphin is as big as your fist. Well, this dolphin's heart was as big as a basketball. He died of congestive heart failure, which is a deficiency of a single vitamin. So I said, are you giving these dolphins any vitamins? No, we're feeding them whole fish. They eat fish, so we just give them whole fish. I said, tell me what species of fish, because there are certain fish in their tissues, they have an enzyme that kills that vitamin. You're not talking about vitamin C? No. Thiamin. Thiamin. Thiaminase. Uh -huh. There's a thiaminase in the tissue of smelt. And they're feeding because of the size. The smelt was the perfect food from a size standpoint for these freshwater dolphins. They, were, they didn't have any thiamin. They didn't have any thiamin because they weren't putting wow. a multiple and extra thiamin in the mouth of those fish when they fed them to the little uh, freshwater dolphins. So you know, told them to change the type of fish they were feeding them, give them a multiple and some extra B vitamins with a lot of thiamin, stop the deaths in the freshwater That's dolphins in the Shedd Aquarium. And so these are the things I could do with nutrition. And here's all these biologists. I mean, these guys are very skilled, very well-trained bi biologists when it came to behavior of the animals and... and um, their dynamics in captivity and so on, and how they reacted uh, um, for territories with one male against right. the other, that kind of stuff. Behavioralist. Yeah, kind of exactly. But they weren't biochemists. They were biologists, but they weren't biochemists. They were biologists, but they weren't biochemists. Yeah. And so I could come in and see something very simple that I'd been studying for 10, 15, 20 years and see it in a heartbeat where they could look at it and they couldn't recognize it. Now, thyme is a fascinating vitamin. Mm -hmm. That's the berry berry vitamin. Exactly. That's the vitamin that they were given. Tell yeah. the story about the chickens and the, and the rice polishings. Well. Um, beriberi berry is a very interesting disease. Uh, sailors, of course, used to die from this by the thousands every year. And as they went around the world and, and their sea voyages were longer and longer and longer, um, more and more sailors, I mean, two-thirds of the crew would be death from beriberi berry by the time they came home, particularly as, as time went along because uh, they demanded modern food. And modern food to them meant polished rice, white rice instead of brown rice. Uh, because that's what rich people ate, and so they wanted that as part of their demand. If we're going to go on this long sea voyage, we want polished rice. Okay. And uh, two-thirds of the crew would die from beriberi. Well, first of all, they get a dementia called Korsakoff syndrome. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which is caused by a thiamin deficiency. Yeah. And then they would get congestive heart failure. It's like a cure for Korsakoff syndrome is thiamin. I they cure just... people in a week. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing, right? But I give them 26,000 times the minimum data requirement. <laughs> I hedge my bet, right? Okay. So, at any rate... Um, uh, just uh, all these diseases that um, these Japanese naval surgeons were really the first ones to recognize there's some problem here when they fed these sailors this polished rice. But the Admiralty, you know, the big guys up there, the Admiralty said, well, listen, these guys are demanding this. This has nothing to do with it. It's got to be some bug. They thought it was a bug. Wow. What year are we talking here? Uh, we're talking about the late 1700s. Wow. Okay, in the 18th century. And, um, and Europeans get the credit for discovering it, but it was really... The Japanese the Polish, naval surgeon. It was a Polish chemist. Kaiser Funk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah, came was up his the name, yeah. But, well, he, he actually identified it 
but before that, the Japanese naval surgeons... They knew there was something in there. They knew there was something yeah. in, in the bran of the rice, in the brown covering, the hull on the rice, was, right. could prevent and reverse that disease. And they would all die of congestive heart failure, but they would all go crazy. They'd lose their minds. Corsica syndrome. Yeah. Before they died, alcohol. Perfect. People who drink alcohol that deactivates thiamine somehow. Well, sure. Well, it, it well alcohol is a liquid sugar, and it makes thiamine is used for metabolizing the alcohol. And so, when you take in sugar or alcohol, yeah, it makes a deficiency worse. Talk about ADD, maybe. How about B1 deficiency, subclinical B1 deficiency for kids who have ADD? They're eating sugar. Maybe th maybe maybe they don't need Ritalin. Maybe they need something like like thiamine or. How about subclinical issues? You know, we talk about the big things like congestive heart failure and beriberi, but what, what are the impacts of subclinical thiamine deficiency where maybe they're just not getting enough thiamine? What are the impacts on our kids? And okay, well, that's a good one. Let's talk about ADD, ADHD, autism. Now, back when I was a kid, there was no such thing as those things, right? Um, in the year um, uh, two, uh, let's see, 1980. In 1980, it was one out of um, 150,000 kids had autism. In the year 2000, it's one out of 150. Today, it's one out of 88 is the new. It just came out last week. Wow. Uh, one out of 88 now has autism. Wow. And basically, when I was a kid, all four of my grandparents were from Eastern Europe. They were beet farmers and, and beef farmers. And so for breakfast, I would have cheese and beets and beef and eggs and... No Cheerios? Uh, no. No corn flakes? <laughs> no. Not when I was a little baby. Nope. And... Um, uh, we didn't have those types of diseases. Well, here comes now, um, 20 years later, kids are being fed on these box cereals full of carbohydrate, processed carbohydrates with sugar on it, and they're getting apple juice. Right. How can you build a brain, which is two-thirds by weight, 75% by weight, is cholesterol and good fats, okay? And so now all they're getting is carbohydrates and sugar, and they're going crazy. Right. So yes. not only are they deficient, but it's costing them nutrients to process all that stuff. Exactly. So it makes the nutritional deficiencies worse. Even worse, right. Right. And so uh, simply, I take kids that haven't spoken in 11 years. You start feeding them eggs, you get them on the 90 essential nutrients, which is what we feed animals, the right. 90 essential nutrients, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids. And after 11 years of not speaking, I have kids who can read the Bible out loud in churches. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Doc, I say this on my radio show all the time. I say, you're going to think it's a miracle, but it's not a miracle. This is the way the body works because yep. you give the body what it needs and it will respond. This amazing system, mm -hmm. this amazing divine system. You touched on cholesterol. I definitely want to talk mm -hmm. about cholesterol. Okay. But before I get to that, uh, my favorite mineral, you know, in the world of nutrition, you get, a f you get favorites, right? You probably have your favorites. And sure. I know one of them that's one of my personal favorites, and I know is one of yours, is selenium. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about selenium, this incredible, incredible mineral, and some of the things that you can use it for. And I want you to uh, give, play special attention on how selenium is involved with the thyroid, how selenium is involved with diabetes, and all the different things that you can use with this incredible mineral that, by the way, is active in microgram quantities, the tiniest of quantities. Maybe touch on that a little bit. Okay, as you say, selenium is one of those wonderful trace minerals, um, which is an essential nutrient. We need it. We can't live without it. And it's... Uh, uh, it has many functions. It's a structural uh, mineral um, when it comes to chromosomes, right? Epigenetics. Uh, epigenetics, we're, we'll get into that, right? But it's a structural piece uh, in the actual normal double helix. Uh, is, part it, of the, it's, is it one of the fingers that you were talking it's about? It's one of the metallic yeah, yeah. fingers to, that keeps this double helix of the chromosome in the, in the proper distance of each other. There's a little strut there. In the middle of these struts, there's all these different minerals, and selenium is one of them. Wow. So the, the helix itself is an incredibly organized structure, mm -hmm. and every little component of it is key. The distance that the, the nucleotides are from each other, all of that is tightly, tightly regulated, and minerals like selenium are involved in making sure that this structure stays intact. That's what the fingers are. Exactly. And when you have a deficiency of selenium, many things happen. In the biochemical level, uh, you can't recycle glutathione, which is one of the most potent antioxidants made by the body. The most, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it's used to protect you from cancer and fend off inflammation in your arteries so you don't get clogged arteries and that kind of stuff. But if you don't have enough selenium, you use one molecule of glutathione and it, it sort of deactivates. But when you have selenium, you can recycle that one molecule of glutathione a thousand times. That's awesome. That's very awesome. And then it protects your brain from MS. When you have MS, you have a terrible, terrible um, selenium deficiency because it allows the free radical damage to the myelin, the white matter of the brain again, and you get these lesions in the brain about the size of a lima bean uh, that cause MS. So supplementing with selenium? For can prevent or reverse MS. Wow. 
Along two, with the 90 essential nutrients. You can't buy it, not by itself. That's right. So 200 micrograms to 400 micrograms? What do you well, mean? I like to be a little heavy-handed. 600? I like to be a little heavy-handed. 800? A milligram, yeah. A milligram is 1,000 micrograms, yeah. Okay. When you have these diseases, you need to, you know, you need to use a bigger hammer, right? Okay, okay. HIV. You can prevent HIV from mutating to AIDS by supplementing with selenium. Wow. One milligram a day. What's the difference between Arthur Ashe, the great black um, tennis player, and uh, Magic Johnson, the great black basketball player? One is dead, one's alive. Yeah, yeah. One's supplementing with selenium, one didn't. Is that what, that's what Magic Johnson's doing? Oh, that's interesting. Now. How about just even just a common cold or just like well, flus and that I'm kind of thing? I'm getting there. Okay. I'm right. getting there. It's very good. You're on top of it. All right. Um, but I also, it's one of the things that's, they actually discovered, Dr. Gerhard Schrauser, a grand man, he's the guy who discovered that um, uh, selenium is an essential nutrient back in 1957. They didn't consider it essential back then. No, they, they considered they it a poison. poison. Yeah, exactly, right. they thought that's it was right. a poison. Even medical doctors today still yeah. think it's a poison, yeah. but it actually was discovered to be an essential nutrient. And the disease he was looking at was liver necrosis, the death of your liver. If you survive death of your liver, you got cirrhosis of the liver, right? And this is all caused by not drinking because 99% of the people who get liver cirrhosis never took a drink of alcohol in their life. Right. It's a selenium deficiency. Wow. I get people off the liver transplant list all wow. the time. Wow, wow, wow. Someone... That's a big problem today, mm -hmm. non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Mm -hmm. That's a huge problem. Fatty liver, yeah. primary sclerosing cholangitis, yeah. liver cirrhosis. Yeah. I've had people, pharmacists, Ben, who've had 32 liver operations at Harvard Medical School. Their livers are the size of an Oreo cookie and I rebuild them in two months to a normal liver. Just using the 90 essential nutrients and extra selenium. Right. Okay. And then there's cataracts are caused by a selenium deficiency wow. and free radical damage, eating fried foods, free radical damage to the lens of the eye and no selenium to protect it. And then you get cardiomyopathy heart disease. I've done Keishon one- Keishon syndrome. Keishon syndrome, That's yep. Right. I've done 1,200 autopsies on kids under the age of 10 in Keishon Province, China, 1,200. Autopsies. Nobody else has ever done that. They're all deficient. They're all deficient yeah. in, in selenium. And partially because of our work there in China, every school kid, when you go to kindergarten, they get a multiple and a, a capsule of selenium. selenium. We've wiped out cardiomyopathy heart disease in children in That's China. That's awesome. Is that awesome? That's awesome. Now, there's a sh there's, isn't there an animal correlate to this Keishon syndrome? Yes. Selenium deficiency? Yes. In sheep? Well... In every animal you can name, there's a, there's a correlation. But in pigs, they call it mulberry heart disease. In sheep, they call it stiff lamb disease because uh -huh. when they get heart disease, they kind of walk with arch back and they're kind of stiff. And in calves, cattle, they call it white muscle disease because when you cut through the heart, instead of having this beautiful kind of reddish purple heart color, uh, it looks like um, a good um, perch muscle. It's white. So they call it white muscle disease. And you can prevent it with... Um, a little uh, bit of selenium. So, well, with the 90 essential nutrients plus extra selenium, if they get it and they survive the first heart attack or you catch it with just arrhythmias in their heart, you give them the selenium, it goes away. How about for the thyroid? The thyroid gland, of course, uh, there's actually a syndrome called Wilson syndrome. The question is, how many nutrients does your thyroid require? A lot, probably. Not. All 90. Yeah. Now, if you ask a physician, iodine, they'll say iodine right. because it's part of the structure right. of the thyroxine thyroid hormone. hormone. But that's only the part of the structure. But for the thyroid gland to work, it needs all 90, of duh, right? And so um, a lot of times when they look at the T3, T4, and the TSH and all that kind of stuff, really what they're looking for is iodine levels. Hmm? And so you can be perfect. They say, well, we don't know why you're having all these symptoms of well, thyroid disease. Because, yeah, we give them iodine and nothing changes. Well, that's because it's a selenium deficiency. That's interesting. Well, selenium is involved in the, in the in hormone the, as well. It's well, part it's, of the structure it, as well, it's no? part of the structure, but it actually is, uh, even equally importantly, it's part of the process of making the hormone, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, as is copper and everything else. And then, of course, it's necessary for the health of your muscles. Muscular dystrophy is selenium. caused. Muscular dystrophy is a selenium deficiency. Wow. Now, a, a fellow by the name of Marvin Ropp and I, who grew up Amish, and he went in and became a Navy SEAL. Going from the Amish world to the Navy SEAL, he comes back after 20 years in the, in the SEALs. He goes back, a worldly man now, and he sees all these kids dying of mustard dystrophy in the Amish community. And so I go there, and I say, well, this is what we see in calves that have mustard dystrophy or white muscle disease. And it's a selenium deficiency. So we went to Purdue University, and sure enough, in Indiana, wherever these kids are that have mustard dystrophy, there's always a selenium deficiency in the soil. So we start giving them the 90 cents of nutrients, giving them extra selenium, and the mustard dystrophy goes away in a couple of weeks. 
Even yeah. if they've been in wheelchairs for years, we That's get them out of wheelchairs to go play That's basketball. It. So we send all this information to Jerry Lewis. This is a gospel true story now. We send all this information to Jerry Lewis. Five he years. Loved it. He went crazy, positive. He loves it. Yeah. I said, now, Jerry, we're not asking for money. We already know the cause, prevention, and cure of muscular dystrophy in kids. We already know this. And we just think it's appropriate that we offer to you the opportunity to make the news release because you're Mr. the guy. Muscular dystrophy. You are. They're Jerry's kids, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're the obvious guy to make the news release if you want to. If you say no, we'll just we'll be happy. But at least my conscience is okay because I've given you the opportunity. He gets excited. He takes it to the medical committee uh, in the Muscular they're Dystrophy not so Foundation. Excited? They fire Jerry Lewis. That's why Jerry Lewis has not been on the telethon for the last oh, two years. Oh, that's an amazing story. And they sent him on a cruise. They actually bought him a ticket to say, we have a non-disclosure contract with you, Jerry. You can lose everything. We'll sue you for everything if you bring this up. And so we're sending you on a cruise. Go enjoy yourself. And don't bring it up. We want you away from here wow. when we're having this telethon this year because everybody's going to say, well, where's Jerry? For the last cruise. Year, it's over with. He's, that's a great story. Yeah, yeah. And so great. they fired Jerry Lewis because we discovered the so cause, prevention, and cure of, oh, and I knew what it was for a long time, but until Marvin Rop came back from being a Navy SEAL and introduced me to the Amish community, I didn't have access to those kids. So um, selenium must for, uh, for, muscular, for muscular dystrophy. But I think your point's well taken that you have to have the entire mighty 90. These things mm -hmm. are specific for disease states, but the entire milieu of the body has to be nutriated. That's right, because everything kind of works together. Yeah. And if you, you have to have the metabolism to be able to repair yourself. You have to have the metabolism to operate just in life. And so to think you can cherry pick one nutrient, this is one of the bad things the medical system does. Allopathic nutrition, I call it. Yes. Where you just use a nutrient like it's one kind of drug, one kind of disease. One exactly, kind of... using a nutrient as a drug. Yeah. Instead of using the whole... I, I liken it to grandma's recipe for um, an angel food cake, for instance. And she dies and she leaves her secret recipe to her favorite granddaughter, right? right. But the granddaughter doesn't like some of the ingredients. She says, I really don't like eggs because of cholesterol theory, right? It's not going to be the same cake. And so you leave the, the eggs out and all you get is a angel food crepe. Yeah. You don't right. get angel right. food cake. Right, right, right. Because all the ingredients work together. Exactly. And the Mighty 90 works together the same way. Yeah. All right, so there's so many things I want to talk about, but I don't think any conversation with Dr. Wallach would be complete without talking about colloidal minerals. Okay. Okay. And uh, first of all, there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding. People don't really understand what exactly a colloidal mineral is. And, and I think it's, it, it's, it makes sense that there'd be misunderstandings. You know, Albert Einstein and, and some of the great physicists, they study colloidal, colloidal solutions, colloidal suspensions. They were so fascinated with how these things work and how they interact with the water and the electrical nature of all that. Why don't you tell folks, first of all, tell folks how you discovered the power of colloidal minerals <clears throat> And exactly what are colloidal minerals and why are they so special and so effective? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Pharmacist Ben. Um, back uh, again in the late 80s, I was working with some of the alternative cancer um, hospitals in Mexico. Now, they invited me to come do some things with them. And um, there, that's a long story how I got there, but that's another time. But at any rate, uh, I, I, one of the problems I had was getting all the nutrients that people needed because most people wouldn't eat calf pellets and dog food and things like that, right? right. And so I had to find a way because in human supplies, it was, not, it was very difficult to get things. And so I needed a source of some really weird trace elements and rare earths, okay, like gallium, right. yttrium, yttrium, neodymium, prosiodymium. Right. Which the body needs. You, know, you get disease if you don't right. have them. Most doctors, you ask them about those. Yttrium deficiencies. Rare earth, europium. Yeah, you ask them yeah. about those things, doctors look at you like a deer in the headlight. Like they've never heard of them, right. right? And so I was looking for those things. Well, here at one of these alternative cancer hospitals is a little gallon glass jug, and it says, take an ounce of this with every meal. And I tasted, woo, it, it kind of shrunk, wrap your lips over your teeth. It was very tart. Right, minerals. It, it, yep. And um, so I said, what is this? He said, well, it's this stuff that comes out of the mountains and has all these different minerals in it. So I took it to Dr. Schrauser, University of California. I said, analyze it. And it had 77 wow. minerals in it, including all these really weird trace minerals and, and rare earths. Exactly what I was looking for. To make this, as what it's turned out now, to be the Alex pack, right? Right. You got it? Right. But that was back in 1985. I had been looking for something, but it was so expensive. Have all the you were looking yeah. for something that would have all those trace minerals. Uh, and the, the rare earths. And if we were to put it together one by one by one, it would cost 
a thousand dollars an hour to take that stuff, right? And so it's too expensive. So here's a natural source, wow. and it had everything in there in optimal amounts. I, I mean, I really got excited because I said, now I've got the tool that I can bring this to the general public, right? Wow. Well, a colloid is actually a mineral that's in suspension rather right. than in solution. So it doesn't dissolve, it hangs. It hangs in there. Now, how does that do that? You've heard of Brownian movement, sure. right? Well, all these particles are the same charge, and so they repel each other. And so they stay in a suspension by their own energy because they're right. repelling each other like little magnets. That's awesome. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And so high, this is a highly electrically charged solution. That's right. It's like but, a magnetic but solution. But they're all the same charge. Right. That's the secret. They're all the same charge. Right. They're that's how they're repelling. Yeah, that's right. Brownian movement. And they knew about that for a long time. But you're talking about one nutrient, one mineral. But here's one with 77 minerals in there. Wow. And there's this... Um, it's almost like a liquid alloy of 77 minerals. Wow. And for instance, if you take a solution, a liter of a solution, you can maximize whatever you can get in there. You get 985 or 989 milligrams. That's all you can get into a solution. There's only so much room in between the water, water molecules. Now in the suspension, I can get 36,000 milligrams. How do you do that? Ah, kidneys, right? <laughs> I can get 36,000 milligrams. Well, when you taste that, that'll, sh you know, that'll shred the enamel off your teeth. It's so acid. So I had to cut it down to 19,000 milligrams. But now we're getting up into the dosage rates. So you don't have to drink seven gallons a day. I had to concentrate it down. I mean, all these little mechanical factors I had to deal with, I had to concentrate it enough to where a human being could take a couple ounces and get enough. Nobody's going to drink seven gallons a day to get right. enough, right? But these are highly concentrated su uh, suspensions. Yes, but I had to concentrate them more. Wow. Right, see? And so this is perfect for me because I could get 19,000 milligrams uh, in a liter, 600, mil 600 uh, um, I could get 600 milligrams in an ounce. That's amazing. That's amazing, right? That's amazing. And so, but in a solution, I could only get 30 milligrams. And so how, what accounts for that difference then? Well, in a suspension, it doesn't matter how much room there is between the water molecules because these guys are in there keeping oh. each other in suspension all the time. They never settle out. They're they, self-suspending. They're self-suspending. They never settle out. Wow. It's, an, it's a, a, a perpetual motion machine. That's, so you're, when you, you're actually drinking a, an electrical, ener you're electrical energy. You're drinking magnetism. <laughs> of sorts, yeah. So you're drinking a magnetic solution. So yes. It, it, would you say that the effect on the body is it, it amps up the magnetic energy? Of the well, body? if you look at the heart, for instance, which is an electrical thing, right. um, when people start getting palpitations, they... Um, uh, are having an electrical conduction problem. So you give them uh, selenium in a, in a colloidal form, problem solved. Wow. Okay. And so uh, it's that simple. But at any rate, then I was able to make liquids. Of course, uh, I think I'm considered the father of liquid supplementation at that level. And in the initial product we had was just what we called plant minerals. I remember and, that. Yeah, 77 plant minerals, uh, which contain all 60 essential minerals in optimal amounts one ounce per 100 pounds of body weight, and most people are deficient in minerals, so just taking those minerals made an enormous positive difference in people's lives. And then people were saying, well, what multiple do I take with it? And so I had to come up with a multiple, and then you think it's tricky to add all the vitamins and amino acids and, and things to it. Now, I tried adding the fatty acid, it turned it into soap. I'm sure, It yeah. became a solid. You can't add, you can't add fatty acid, it could, but it's, it's a miracle that you could add all that other stuff in there. That was, that's some amazing formulations, and let me tell you something. I formulate for a living, mm -hmm. and the formulations that you guys, have, Young Jevy's come up with some formulations that are absolutely stupendous, and it started off with that bottle that, of minerals. That bottle of minerals, mm -hmm. that bottle of minerals. From, we just kept adding the, things to it, and of course, we'd run into the thing like turning into soap, and we had bottles exploding and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff, and so in the early days, it was quite adventurous. And then, of course, uh, right now, we have in the Alex pack, which you can buy by itself or part of the Alex pack. I like the Alex because you got a complete thing is the Beyond Tangerine has 245 nutrients Dude, in it. That's a stupendous product. That's a stupendous, Isn't that wild? stupendous product. That's it nice. has 300 milligrams of these minerals per serving. It has... Lots uh, of B vitamins. Well, mega doses. Mega doses, yeah. right, right. And then it has 115 super juices. This, this is not, we're not talking about a V8 here. Right. We're talking B... Or a V one hundred and fifteen. That's amazing. V one hundred and fifteen. Yeah, V one fifteen, not V eight. Right? Yeah, be... Plus a thousand milligrams of vitamin C. Yeah. Plus copper. Plus selenium. Well, plus all sixty. Plus essential... gluco is there glucosamine? I think yes, in there, there is. Well. That, mm -hmm. No, that's a that's an amazing, amazing product. If, if people don't do anything but that, they're mm -hmm. going to notice dramatic results. Oh, huge, huge. 
And of course, kids like it because it tastes good. Tastes great. And then for absorption, that's another thing. You know, in pharmacy school, we study delivery. That's one of the main things we study is delivery. And they tell you, if you want to deliver things in the body, you don't want to use a suppository and you don't want to use an injection, drink the stuff. Mm -hmm. And that is, that was actually, in addition to the colloidal minerals, the nature of, of the colloids, the fact that it was in, in a way you could drink it and you would get instant absorption is so important because people have digestive problems. Everybody has digestive problems. Bypassing digestive problems with liquids, go ahead. Well, I'll answer that question in a second. But what we did was even, I thought, more fun. We take these colloids, which in themselves are very absorbable, right? And then we- Tremendously well, absorbable. Very right? absorbable yeah. compared to even solutions. And so then we turn it into a coffee crystal type technology. Now talk about that. Well, coffee crystals, are not actually like you're making an instant drink, okay, because what we did was turn it into a brewed thing that has all these juices and vitamins and minerals and amino acids in it. We made these huge solutions, and then we freeze-dried it, and they turned it into oh. crystals. You just add water, and suddenly now it became... It rehydrates. Becomes, it, it rehydrates, becomes the original uh, suspension again. Is now. that what makes the BTT so special? It's like freeze-dried. Yes. Do you remember that commercial they used to have for the freeze-dried coffee? Mm -hmm. That whole... Uh, well, that's, that's the coffee crystals. Yeah, it's the same idea. And so we take a colloid, and we turn it into the coffee crystal technology. So it re -colloid, It becomes it, a colloid it, it again. It becomes a colloid that, again. So the BTT is... It, it, it's, a col it's a colloidal suspension. It's, well, it's, it's a colloid, not a solution. And, and then we put it into re-suspension. But when people reconstitute it, it becomes a suspension it, again. It becomes a suspension again. So they're there actually go. drinking this colloidal liquid again. Exactly. Even though it's it's portable, it's portable, and you can carry it around. And, and light, you can take it on the plane with you. You can take it on the plane. <laughs> That's great. All right. So, uh, cholesterol. Okay. I want to talk about cholesterol. Uh, statin drugs. Hundreds of millions of prescriptions are filled for statin drugs every year. Uh, everybody's terrified of cholesterol. You, somebody here was asking about eating eggs, and people don't want to eat eggs. They don't want to eat the yolk and eggs, and there's so much misunderstandings about cholesterol. Please uh, tell our listeners, tell, our, tell the viewers a little bit about, uh, first of all, what cholesterol is, why it's so important, and then uh, okay. how, you can, how you can make sure that you have enough cholesterol in your body using dietary strategies. <clears throat> well, first of all, cholesterol is an important part of our human structure. Every cell wall is like 30% cholesterol. Right. Okay. Every cell wall, if the trillions and trillions of cells in your body, every one of them, 30% or more, in some cases, 60% of the cell wall is cholesterol. Nerves. So you can't, make, you can't make cells without the stuff. That's right. And cells won't work without it. They die without it. And then 75% um, of your brain weight, the matter of your brain, the myelin, cholesterol. is cholesterol. Okay? If you don't have enough cholesterol, guess what you get? Alzheimer's disease. It's a physician-caused disease for lowering your cholesterol. Then you can't make sex hormones. Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and adrenal hormones are all steroid hormones. 95% by weight is cholesterol. cholesterol. Vitamin D3 is cholesterol. 7 hydroxy 25 cholesterol, right? Right. It's cortisol, cholesterol Cortis hormone. Exactly. So, Aldosterone. Uh, adrenal hormones, all these things are cholesterol. So, you don't have enough cholesterol, you get erectile dysfunction, you get menopause, you get adrenal exhaustion, you yeah. get Alzheimer's disease. All of it. All of it. How can this thing, this beautiful chemical, this beautiful molecule be so demonized in our culture? It's amazing to me. Well, here's why. Because again, biologists don't know anything about chemistry, right? Doctors don't know anything about nutrition. Right. So that's a maxim. Well, in 1971, after having done 20,000 autopsies, I wrote a paper which compared the plugged arteries in vegans versus plugged arteries in meat eaters. Huh. Looking at this cholesterol series, right? Well, the vegans are eating what the, uh, grains. Well, and grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Right. And guess who had the worst clogged arteries? Vegans. Vegans. Right. Because There's of the no oils. cholesterol in meat. Well. There was a little bit of cholesterol in the, in, the, in the scarring of the arteries, and that's why they, in their brains they thought it was a cholesterol. But there was turbulence in there, and the body's putting cholesterol, and they're trying to smooth it out, you know, like these nonstick pans. That, the, the, the body's response was to throw cholesterol at it, trying to smooth out the turbulence. Now, when people eat meat, is there cholesterol in steak? Is there actually cholesterol milk, even after it's cooked and after oh, yeah. it's processed? Yeah, as long as you don't burn it. Okay, now, but here's, here's the beauty of that study. 1971. 20,000 autopsies, and they come out, and this is published in an international Danish um, uh, pathology journal, Acta Pathologica, translated into six languages. This went around. Millions of doctors, millions of pathologists all over the world read this. Now, they all laughed at me because they were saying, well, Wallach must be sniffing glue because cholesterol causes heart disease. Well, guess what? Um, where were vegans getting their cholesterol? They're not eating meat. They're not eating eggs. They're making it. 
the oils in the grains are oxidizing because they were stored improperly. So now, the and then they stir fry in extra, extra, extra virgin, virgin, virgin olive oil. You turn those oils into trans fatty acids and heterocyclic amines, right? Right. By heating them, they eat a lot of salad dressings. So where's the cholesterol coming from? The, from the body makes a little bit as a sort of um, uh, again, a, a protective a device, protective device uh -huh. kind of like this non-stick pan again, right? Uh -huh. Okay, but it's, it, it came from your own body. So making it's upregulating your the body's manufacturing system of cholesterol. Yeah, but it's it's, it's infinitesimally small. It wasn't uh -huh. even a factor. But they picked that's the only strange thing uh -huh. that was in there, right? And so they picked that out for some reason, and they came up with these statin drugs to lower cholesterol. Uh -huh. Well, here comes now forty-one years later. The FDA and Science News just a couple of weeks ago came out and said, uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem. They put out new warnings on statin drugs saying... Diabetes. It will fit, increases your risk of diabetes by 50%, increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 100%. That's amazing. If you go on a cholesterol-restricted diet and you take cholesterol-lowering drugs, statin drugs, you will get Alzheimer's disease. Oh, yeah. Okay? And I said that in 1971 and they all laughed at me. Because you cholesterol to make neurons. You That's right. Make brain you must cells. eat eggs. The egg is a perfect food. Uh, you start out with a, a chick on that egg the size of a lentil, as thick as a piece of paper with the diameter of a lentil, right? I mean, we're talking about three or four millimeters in diameter, uh, one-tenth of a millimeter thick. That's the chick and there's the yolk and the white. That's all food for the chick. In 21 days of incubation, yeah. You have a chick with a beating heart and lungs and legs and all the muscles and feathers and skin and eyes and brain. All from that little egg. All from that little egg. And so it's a perfect food. Yeah. And so if you want to keep your brains, you want to have a great sex life, you want to don't, you know, you want to have uh, your adrenal glands are happy, you don't want to have menopause, you don't want electron, right, right. Elect, erectile dysfunction, you better be eating 6 to 10 to 12. I eat a minimum of 8 eggs a day. I try for 12 every day. Where else can you get? What other foods would you recommend? Uh, eat the chicken skin, throw the chicken away. <laughs> Just don't eat it fried, okay? Uh, you can eat... Fish skin? Uh, uh, yeah, you get a little bit of cholesterol actually in uh, salmon, in the fat underneath the, the uh, salmon skin. Uh, you can get it from uh, red meat. Uh, you can get it from um, uh, lard and butter. You get a little bit of cholesterol and butter. What do you think about what nutrients would you use with your cholesterol? Any particular vitamin E or any essential fatty acids? Well, sure. Acid? You have to take the 90 essential nutrients, nine which essential. includes vitamin E, and we're talking about selenium and vitamin A. All these things are um, antioxidants in their own right. Now, vitamin A, uh, why did they call it vitamin A? Because it was the first one discovered. When it was discovered over 4,000 years ago by the Egyptians, they could get rid of night blindness, which we know is caused by vitamin A deficiency, yeah. by giving people yeah. extracts of, of liver. Liver. They'd, right. and they'd squeeze liver, get the juice out of the liver, give it to you, and night blindness would go away. Well, it, vitamin A is a stupendously yeah. important vitamin as well. How about for the immune system, vitamin A for the immune well, system? Of course, because it's an antioxidant. Yeah. It helps protect you from free radicals and also helps your immune system uh, fight against um, organisms, transmitted organisms like bacteria and viruses and fungus and yeast and all kinds of stuff. So every one of the 90 essential nutrients is important. They're called essential nutrients. They're not optional nutrients. The word right? essential, that's what yeah. that means. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, real quick, I wonder if you could touch upon the digestive system. Mm -hmm. We got uh, 80 million Americans with digestive problems. One out of three Americans is dealing with some kind of digestive issue. When we know with liquid nutrients, you can bypass a lot of that. But what would you recommend for folks in terms of not essential nutrients necessarily, but accessory nutrients that people can use to support digestive wellness? Okay, well, first of all, the old theory used to be you are what you eat, right? Right. That's not right. It's what you absorb. You are what you absorb. Yeah. Very good. You right. are what you absorb. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you pick the right number, when you said 30% of Americans have a terrible digestive problem, um, Mayo Clinic uh, came out in 2009 and said 30% of Americans have gluten intolerance. Now, there's some communities that eat a lot of grains because they're, you know, for whatever reason, cheap. that's, well, it's cheap. It's stored for years in case there's some imminent disaster, right? We're talking about the Amish, the Mennonites, the Hutterites, the uh, Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists are all vegetarians, they eat a lot of grains. They have 80% gluten intolerance. Hmm. Now what that does is you lose the villi in your small intestines and you get celiac disease, you get diverticulitis, you get um, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease. And you, you don't absorb your, and you don't absorb your nutrients. You lose 85% ability to absorb them. So what's 15% of nothing? <laughs> nothing. Very little. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so. Uh, the problem we have now is all these people now are being told to eat whole grains, 
And so there's all this gluten intolerance happening. So people are not absorbing what little nutrition there might be naturally in the food. Right. And they're not supplementing. And so you have to get off of gluten. You have to supplement properly. And then 99% of these problems go away. You're talking about um, <clears throat> when you're talking about diseases, for instance, like, um, oh, you have a baby born with muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, cleft palate, they're born deaf, and all this kind of stuff. Invariably, the mother will be gluten intolerant. Because what little nutrients are in the food, she can't absorb them very efficiently. So she's got a malnourished fetus. She's got a malnourished fetus. Wow. It's not genetic. Oh, yeah, it's malnourishment. It's, it's malnourishment. But here's the thing that gives doctors a little bit of hope that their theory is correct. Gluten intolerance is passed on through cord blood or breast milk. It's not genetic, but the glutens are passed on. The allergens. Through, well, they're not even allergens. They're not. It's not an allergy. It's an intolerance. So, in other words, the the proteins, the peptides, are passed through in the milk, and the the baby becomes intolerant to it yes, as well. Yes, exactly. Now, here's the deal. Nobody's allergic to poison ivy because there's no pollen involved. Nobody eats it for salads, but everybody is intolerant of it. Uh, now you rub poison ivy on right. yourself, you don't get an allergic reaction. You don't get an immune reaction. Mm -mm. You have a contact dermatitis. Right. The same thing when you eat gluten and you have a gluten intolerance, you don't get an allergic reaction. You get a contact. It's a mechanical issue. Would you say it's, it's a mechanical? It's a chemical irritant. You get a, you get a contact enteritis. Uh huh. Okay. So, so it's not necessarily an allergic reaction. It is not an yeah. allergic reaction. It's, a, it's still an immune reaction. No. It's not even an immune no. reaction. Is it mechanical? It's a chemical irritant. Uh huh. So it's gluten is an irritant. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. a contact and bakers, bakers will get it, too. There's oh, baker's yeah. dermatitis. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Same, same thing. Same idea. And so what you do is you get these people on gluten-free diets. Their asthma goes away in two weeks. It's amazing. And you have a woman who's had three kids in a row with mustard dystrophy. You put her on a gluten-free diet. You give her the, the 90 essential nutrients appropriate right. for her body weight. You throw in some extra selenium. She'll never have another child with mustard dystrophy. She can have 10 more kids, but none of them will have mustard dystrophy because it's not genetic. That's amazing. Now, uh, are there other things in grains aside from gluten? Gluten gets all the press, but there's other things as well. Are there other proteins, other peptides? Well, other sure, there are allergens. You can get a wheat allergy, but it's not necessary to be gluten intolerant. Uh -huh. Is grain a problematic food, in, in your opinion? Y yes, it is, because human beings were never designed to eat grain. Yeah. Now, the, the animals that do very well with the grain are they ruminants. They have extra stomachs. They have four stomachs. Yeah. So if we have four stomachs, maybe we could be, we'd be able well, to eat Well, we'd that be able to eat grain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. have a single stomach, and we don't have the capacity to handle grains like, like an antelope and a, 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 buff, you know, a buffalo and the, a horses and cattle and sheep and goats and uh, all these animals with four stomachs. There are they, when you look around the world, other than one-celled animals, the four-stomach animals are in the most universal form. They're everywhere. On every continent, every place, there's more species of ruminant animals than there are elephants. So our digestive system just isn't designed to eat these kinds of That's things. That's right. Isn't that interesting? You know about Jared Diamond, right? Mm -hmm. He wrote a paper called uh, Agriculture was the, the worst thing that ever happened to us in human history, something along those lines. But the idea being that we're not supposed to be eating these kinds of foods. Germs, guns, and... Uh, guns, germs, and steel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the idea is that we're not supposed to be eating these kinds of foods. Uh, what about gluten-free? What about gluten-free flours and gluten-free grains? What's your take on those? Well, gluten-free grains are what? We're talking about millet, yeah, buckwheat, which is not wheat. Quinoa. Quinoa, and you're looking at rice. You okay. ever hear the old macrobiotic diet? I, know, I don't know a lot well, about it. Well, during the 60s, the hippies, all those flower children were running around eating the macrobiotic diet, which was essentially a, um, uh, a, a German cleansing diet that was made from brown rice and steamed vegetables. It was only supposed to be done for two weeks, but they really they felt good on this stuff, right? And so they had a little bit of fish to it, maybe some eggs, so you get enough protein so you could live on it forever. And I mean, these people were solving problems like eczema, asthma, were all going away on this macrobiotic diet. And they said, it's the magic of the brown rice. No, it's because they gave up wheat. Uh-huh, that's okay? interesting. And there was this Michio Kuchi who popularized uh, he, he's a Korean guy who popularized the macrobiotic diet. He had terminal pulmonary tuberculosis. I mean, his 90% of his lungs were filled up with tubercle abscesses, and he was beyond hope, according to the doctors, right? He got on the macrobiotic diet, gluten and free. three months later, he's gluten-free, he's cured. That's a great story. Now, now uh, 
I don't know if people really recognize that you are a prolific writer and you write some great books. Stuff. You <laughs> write some great books. And what I like about your books is how you pull together all these disparate fields, these disparate sciences, mm -hmm. uh, anthropology and sociology mm -hmm. and history and economics and nutrition and chemistry and biology, you pull the whole thing together. And you got a great story, and I think it's in Hell's Kitchen. I'm not sure which one. I think it might be Hell's Kitchen. We talk about the, the wood ash. Mm -hmm. And that's just a brilliant story about how people got the idea that you could actually get healthy by using ash. And you see sometimes you'll see ash on, uh, in the ingredient decks or in the nutritional uh, facts on dog food. And uh, Tell us a little bit about this whole idea of ash and minerals and how that works in, in terms of nutritional, uh, nutritional power. And nutritional well, sure. Well, this goes back to the caveman. Was that Hell's Kitchen, by the way? Is that well, it was in Hell's Kitchen. There's a little bit of that in the book Rare Earths Been Cures. Okay. And uh, also a little bit in the Let's Play Doctor in Martin. It's all, yeah, it's okay. in all of it because um, in the old days, even in the caveman days, you know, they had fires, right, for their fuel. Right. And um, the cave's going to get filled up with ashes. Right. So they had to throw it outside. It didn't take long to recognize it. You know where they were throwing those ashes? The green stuff, the leaves were twice as big <laughs> than where it didn't get. So when they started gardens, they would throw the wood ashes into the gardens rather than just throw it down the stream uh, or in the recycling bin to save the earth, right? They'd put it in the gardens. Well, wood ashes are not ashes. Wood ashes are really the minerals that the tree had sucked up out of the ground. And when you burn the wood for fuel, the minerals don't burn. So you have a powder in the fire pit, the fireplace, the wood stove. The ashes are the minerals that aren't burning. Yes, they put them in the garden. So then the okra and the tomatoes and the corn and the sweet potatoes and the beans and peas and cucumbers suck it all up. Eat your vegetables and your grains. You got it that way. You got your minerals in that fashion. Nobody made the connection yet. They were using it as a fertilizer, but they never made the connection. They were getting minerals from it. They never did that. Um, but... When I know the exact moment when everything changed. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, September 4th, 1882, when Thomas Edison pulled the switch on the first commercial electric generating plant. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, September 4th, 1882, he pulled the switch on the first commercial electric generating plant on Pearl Street in New York City on the, on the bluff overlooking the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. Within 10 years after that, every city dweller had switched over to electricity for heating and cooking. So How many wood they ashes? Need, they didn't need any more wood ash. No, they needed them. But how many wood ashes were left over when you cooked and heated with, with electricity? Nothing. Zero. So what did they do to replace all those minerals they'd been getting for thousands of years? Nothing. They got sick. They got sick now for diseases they never heard of before. Oh, how interesting. So mm -hmm. with electricity? Yeah. It, oh, it just displaced where our source of minerals. That's interesting. It was sort of a change of, of just like right now, um, you can't hardly find a pay phone in an airport because of cell phones have replaced it. Newspapers are going away um, because all the uh, all little the classified internet. ads are going away because of the, of the uh, cell phones and eBay and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so is the postal service going away because email. of email? Yeah. Okay, well, the same thing happened when you had the um, uh, electric stove come along. They didn't to, there's no ash anymore. No ash anymore. But they didn't make up the difference. Nobody knew to make up the difference. And so wood ash has been, when you look at the top, and this is where the book um, Immortality comes in, um, we looked at the top 20 longevity cultures on Earth. We did it through National Geographic. We looked at, we read 60 years worth of National Geographic because we knew we'd have to spend millions of dollars of our personal money and years and years and years. And then people would say, well, Wallach, we don't believe this one, and we'd argue about that one. So we took everything from the National Geographic, give them plenty of credit and so forth. We used their pick of the top 20 longevity cultures. We have 40 times 100 year olds we do. They have 100 year old per 250 population. We have 100 year old per 10,000. Wow. Okay. Which cultures? Well, we we're talking about things like Sardinians, the Nicoyans in the Pacific coast to Costa Rica, really weird places you never right. heard of, Okinawans. Right? And so uh, the Hunzas up on the Pakistani border T with China. Lake Titicaca. Lake, yeah, the Titicacas and that kind of stuff. It's really, really weird. All top 20 Longevity cultures are third world cultures. They're, they're illiterate. They have no doctors, no medical system. They have no utilities. Glacier milk. What do they have? Well, I thought that's what it was in the beginning. But the universal thing that they picked was they all use wood for fuel. Oh. And by dumb luck, pharmacist Ben, by dumb luck, when you looked at the agricultural schools, at the universities and the countries in which these cultures exist, by actual analysis of the land that they grew their food on, and they got the trees that they use for wood, for fuel, they had 60 minerals in their soil. <laughs> By dumb luck. By dumb luck. <laughs> yeah. That's great. All right, we just, we talked to our friend, uh, 
Aaron just a few minutes ago, and he's an amazing, amazing testimony to your to uh, everything you talk about. Lost 100 pounds. Everybody wants to lose weight. Obesity is ridiculous. We're the number it's, one obese nation in the world. That we're the starving obese. We are. It's crazy what's out there. By uh, by 2030, they estimate 50 percent. Mm -hmm. Not overweight, doc. Obese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So how can we use the Mighty 90 to lose? some way, especially now with Christmas and, and Thanksgiving, is how can folks use the Mighty 90 to lose some weight? Well, again, pharmacists been, we're the number one obese nation in the world. We spend more money for health care than all the nations of the world combined, yet we're the number one obese nation in the world. What's going on here? What that tells you, you don't have to be too bright to stand back and say, how could we be the number one obese nation in the world? What does it say about the level of understanding of obesity by our doctors and our government? They right. know nothing. nothing. Otherwise, we'd be number 204, right? We'd be the thinnest people on earth and the healthiest. But we're number one obesity because they know nothing about obesity. In their theory, you know what I'm saying? In their theory, yeah. obesity is caused from lack of exercise and a disease of excess. You're eating too much. Right. Because they think that we're like an oven. They think if you eat carbohydrates, it's only 4.5 calories. Calories in, calories out. Exactly. 4.5 calories per gram as opposed to 9 calories per gram for fat. You can't buy fat. It's fat-free, low-fat, no-fat. Right. Fat. But we're oh, still yeah. fat. We're still obese. <laughs> okay, and that's because it is not a disease of excess, and it's not a disease of lack of exercise. When you're obese or even overweight, it's a disease of deficiency. You're deficient in a couple of minerals. So obesity is actually a deficiency disease. Yes. Okay. Obesity is deficiency disease of a couple of minerals. All right. And the symptom of the deficiency of these couple of minerals is the munchies. Ah, so you can cure the munchies by using these? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So what are the minerals? Well, I won't tell you yet. <laughs> because right. if I tell everybody, what I want them to do is get that book, Hell's Kitchen, and read the whole story. Okay, so it's See just that? a couple of minerals that will take care of the munchies. Well, it's a, well, there's two minerals. That if you have those, a deficiency of those two minerals, you're going to be one of these people who weigh 600, 800, 1,200 pounds. But any mineral deficiency, not vitamin, vitamin, you can be a deficient in all the vitamins you want, and you won't gain weight. Huh, it's mineral deficiency. It's a mineral deficiency. In horses, it's called cribbing. They chew on the fence. Right. How about pica? It, is that what pica is? Uh, pica. Pica, yeah. Mm -hmm. And little kids will eat dirt and stuff Lead like pain. that. Mm -hmm. and, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. It's caused by mineral deficiency. Huh. Only. So when people have the munchies, their body is in it's, the body's wisdom is let's go get some minerals, and they're trying to trying to find these minerals. You're driving you to eat something yeah. to find the minerals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So using the Mighty 90 and using these minerals will take care of the munchies and take care of the weight loss. Suddenly now, you, if you just get on the Alex pack, take the 90 essential nutrients. Right. You'll lose 10, 15, 20 pounds in a month. We see this with, all the time. Yeah, without even thinking. Yeah. Because suddenly now, your portions are automatically get smaller because yeah. you're tired of throwing food away. Yeah. And uh, you're not going to eat between meals. You'll, you'll take some snacks and think, you know, I'm, I don't even know why I took this. I'm not even really that hungry, but out of habit, you're doing it. And it doesn't take you long to figure out I don't need to do this anymore. So dieting isn't even hard. Once, once you get the nutrients I that would, you need. I wouldn't even use that term. Yeah. What I would do is talk about portion control as opposed to dieting, right? because you don't even have to think about portion control because when the pike and the, and the munchies goes away, portion control is just yeah. sort of self-regulating, yeah. right? Now, to speed it up, we have actually have what we call the uh, slender FX weight management system, which has a mirror replacer in it, uh, which is 80 calories and, and no sugar, so it's great for diabetics who need to lose weight. It's only 80 calories. You could have two of those meals a day. I like to throw in a couple of eggs. Uh, and make it with water, and you're only going to get like a 250 calorie meal. So two of those is 500 calories. You're going to have a 300 or 500 calorie meal. You're down below 1,000 calories. And you have all your nutrients. You have all your nutrients, yeah. right? Because you're still going to take your 90 essential right. nutrients. You're going to take your Alex pack, even though you've cut your calories, your portion control is way down here. But you've, you're still taking your 90 essential nutrients, and you're going to lose weight. We see it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's the most dramatic example of how powerful this stuff is, mm -hmm. is the weight loss. Yes. And the weight loss isn't even, shouldn't even necessarily be the target of what you're looking for. That's like an... It like just a, happens. It just happens. Yes. It happens on its own. Now, if somebody needs to lose 25, 50, 75, 100 pounds or more, then we throw in what we call ASAP. I like to add ASAP. Yeah. ASAP is an acronym for as slim as possible. Right. But I like to say ASAP, ASAP, because it's as slim as possible, now. as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. now, exactly. <laughs> and so... Um, what I like to do, if you need to lose 50 pounds or less, you put one dropper full under your tongue um, of this liquid, which it is, it's, it's amino acids, which is the raw material for your pituitary to make certain hormones. Like growth hormone. No, like HC. Oh, H O. Oh, okay, all right, okay. all right. Yeah. And so, don't tell anybody. I won't say anything about that. <laughs> it's a very important hormone. Though. Yeah, and so, um, instead of going and getting prescription injections, right. you do this yourself. Right. 
And you're going to lose, you know, a quarter of a pound, half a pound, two pounds a day, depending on how you are with that portion control piece, right? And just like you said, Aaron lost 100 pounds. We have thousands of people every I see month. It. It's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. And I see it around the world. People are just, this product's going around the world now. Yeah. And um, you but take... Even, but even, they're adding years to their life. They're oh, decreasing yeah. the likelihood of arthritis and degenerative diseases and cancer, God forbid. And cancer, heart, heart disease. All of that. All of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, it's a combination of the 90 essential nutrients, the Alex pack is a combination of um, the uh, super juices that's in the BTT, the Beyond Tangerine, right. 115 super juices, uh, antioxidants fending off the bad guys. Magnesium? Uh, well, it's all in there. Yeah, well, the, osteo, like, the, the osteo FX Plus, we haven't even talked about that one. Yeah. That's a wonderful well, product. Well, part the of the Alex pack. Yeah, yeah. It's all in there. And so at any rate, um, obesity goes away very quickly. Um, but when you say, uh, right now they're predicting 50% obesity by the year 2030. That tells you that they don't know what to do. Because if they knew what to do, they say, okay, right now we're 36% obesity. But it'll be Here's less. what we do. Yeah. And by 2030, it's going to be 20%. They don't know what to do. They have no earthly yeah. idea because their, their theory has failed them. Yeah. And they cannot believe it's a disease of deficiency. And they're little pea brains that cannot believe that it's a disease of deficiency. Well, they're still operating that steam engine mentality where you put the coal in and you get a fire. And they don't understand that the body's not a steam engine. There's a whole, it's a, it's a metabolic system. It's yes. a chemistry system. Okay, now... The spin-off of that, of course, they say that people who are obese, they have a higher rate of diabetes. diabetes. Yep. That's, that's this sort of cousin disease here. Right. They run together, but not all the time. You can have people who are obese don't have diabetes, but they do tend to run together. And we've known for 70 years that, uh, that diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which makes up 98% of the diabetic population, is a simple mineral deficiency disease again. It's not genetic in any way, shape, or form. Right. It is not genetic in any way, shape, or form, for emphasis, right? Right. It is a simple mineral deficiency disease, and I have to tell you this story. You'll appreciate this, pharmacist, man. There's a fellow out there by the name of Jerry Murphy. He's he's an owner of one of the largest, um, I think it's the third largest um, medical laboratory in America. He services 7,000 hospitals and tens of thousands of doctors, private offices every day with his medical laboratory. This guy's got three it's PhDs. Like a diagnostic, like a diagnostic? Oh, a diagnostic yeah. laboratory. Yeah, you, they take specimens and yeah. send them to the laboratory. They send the results back to the doctor, right? I mean, this guy has three PhDs, literally, he has three PhDs. He doesn't have in diabetes. Medical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he had terrible, brittle diabetes. I mean, his blood sugar is off the chart, even with injectable insulin. And he his knows a about all this stuff. Well, he has access to the finest endocrinologists, the cutting wow. edge of research on what you do for diabetes, all the drugs. I mean, he knows everything about diabetes the medical system knows. Well, mutual friend introduces us. And because they've been talking about diabetes for 25, 30 years, right? And so I said, well, yes, sir, I can help you. I can, I can get your A1C hemoglobin down below 5 within a couple of months. I can get your blood sugar down below 100 without medication. You'll be an ex-diabetic. And he looks at me like, oh, yeah, right. right. He says, who are you? <laughs> so I had to introduce myself a little bit. He said, well, I don't believe you. So I'll tell you what, give, you know, give me a test. I mean... Um, give it a try. You have everything to gain, nothing to lose. You're not being successful at what you're doing. He says, okay, I'll give you 90 days, Wally. He says, if you can get my A1C hemoglobin down from 8.9, down below 5, within 90 days, if you can get my blood sugar consistently down below 100 without medication within 90 days, I'll be your best friend. Wow. I'll fly around my jet plane. I will show up spontaneous at meetings. You won't even know. I'll just appear and give my testimony. I will brag about you. I will put every one of my employees on your program and I'll stop all my Matt. insurance. And you knew you could do it. You knew you I could was self-insure. Well, I've been doing it every day for 35 years. Yeah. And so he said, but I'll tell you what, if you fail, if in 90 days you haven't gotten rid of my diabetes, I will hire somebody whose only job is to go around every place where you're going to give a talk and tell everybody in the newspapers and interview, have, be interviewed and tell everybody what a quack you are. Right. I said, okay, Jerry, let's do it. Let's go for it. And he was kind of shocked that I didn't want to negotiate, right, and equivocate. Right. And he was, I said, let's do it. Well, to make a long story short, in two months' time, following yeah. exactly what I told him to do, and he was very good, and he was impeccable in doing exactly what I told him, his A1C hemoglobin dropped from 8.9 down to 4.3, and his blood sugar went down to 62 without medication. That's amazing. And you know what? It's you, the way you put it and the way you uh, frame it, it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy. And I want everybody to understand this is easy. Mm -hmm. If you have diabetes, if you have a blood sugar problem and you've been told you're going to be on insulin the rest of your life and you're going to be on drugs the rest of your life, this is easy because it's a metabolic problem. And once you change your body's chemistry, it can't help but follow. Now, uh, that gets us to what I, my personal favorite product, 
and you know we all have our favorite products, but my personal favorite product is the Sweeties. Yes. And that's because that's the secret sauce. That's the secret sauce, right? For, it's for the type chrom two diabetes. The chromium and the vanadium, and these two minerals are so amazing for blood sugar. Real quick, if you could just tell the listeners a little bit about chrom chromium, especially, but a little bit about vanadium. Well, these two minerals have been known again for 70 years to uh, support your body's ability to metabolize carbohydrates and fats and, and sugars at the cellular level, support healthy blood sugar by sensitizing your cell membranes to insulin. That's what they do. They're, they're sort of the cofactor necessary so your cell wall can recognize insulin, right. so it can speak the language of insulin. People who have type 2 diabetes, contrary to what doctors tell their patients, when you have type 2 diabetes, you're making as much as 10 times more insulin than a non-diabetic. It's resistance to the insulin. Exactly. So the insulin level is going up because your body keeps trying, right. keeps pumping out more, saying, why aren't you responding? Well, that's because you're missing that key. It's, it's kind of like the combination uh, on a combination lock. And if you take this along with the 90 essential nutrients, right. by themselves you'll get okay results. But if you take those two by themselves, you'll be unhappy. You say, well, that Wallach thing didn't work. You must take them along with the 90 essential nutrients. The B nutrients. vitamins, the vitamin C. And, and all 90 yeah, essential magnesium, nutrients. Magnesium, right. In their theory, you know what I'm saying? In their theory, yeah. obesity is caused from lack of exercise and a disease of excess. You're eating too much. Right. Because they think that we're like an oven. They think if you eat carbohydrates, it's only 4.5 calories, calories. in, calories out. Exactly. 4.5 calories per gram as opposed to 9 calories per gram for fat. You can't buy fat. It's fat-free, low-fat, no-fat. Right. Fat. But we're oh, still yeah. fat. We're still obese. <laughs> okay, and that's because it is not a disease of excess and it's not a disease of lack of exercise. When you're obese or even overweight, it's a disease of deficiency. You're deficient in a couple of minerals. So obesity is actually a deficiency disease. Yes. Okay. Obesity is a deficiency disease of a couple of minerals. All right. And the symptom of the deficiency of these couple of minerals is the munchies. Ah, so you can cure the munchies by using these? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. So what are the minerals? Well, I won't tell you yet. <laughs> <laughs> because right. if I tell everybody, what I want them to do is get that book, Hell's Kitchen, and read the whole story. Okay, so it's so just a couple of minerals that will take care of the munchies. Well, it's a, well, there's two minerals. If you have those a deficiency of those two minerals, you're going to be one of these people who weigh 600, 800, 1200 pounds. But any mineral deficiency, not vitamin, vitamin, you can be a deficient in all the vitamins you want and you won't gain weight. Huh, it's mineral deficiency. It's a mineral deficiency. In horses, it's called cribbing. They chew on the fence. Right. How about pica? It, is that what pica is? Uh, pica. Pica, yeah. Mm -hmm. And little kids will eat dirt and stuff Lead like pain. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's caused by mineral deficiency. Huh. Only. So when people have the munchies, their body is in it's, the body's wisdom is let's go get some minerals and they're trying to, trying to find these minerals. You're driving you to eat something yeah. to find the minerals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So using the Mighty 90 and using these minerals will take care of the munchies and take care of the weight loss. So you know, if you just get on the Alex pack, take the 90 essential nutrients, right. you'll lose 10, 15, 20 pounds in a month. We see with, this all with, the time. Yeah, without even thinking. Yeah. Because suddenly now your portions are automatically get smaller because yeah. you're tired of throwing food away. Yeah. And uh, you're not going to eat between meals. You'll you'll take some snacks and think, you know, I'm. I don't even know why I took this. I'm not even really that hungry, but out of habit, you're doing it. And it doesn't take you long to figure out I don't need to do this anymore. So dieting isn't even hard. Once, once you get the nutrients I that would, you need... I wouldn't even use that term. Yeah. What I would do is talk about portion control as opposed to dieting. Right. Because you don't even have to think about portion control because when the pica and the, and the munchies goes away, portion control is just yeah. sort of self-regulating, yeah. right? Now, to speed it up, we have actually have what we call the uh, slender FX weight management system, which has a mirror replacer in it, uh, which is 80 calories and, and no sugar. So it's great for diabetics who need to lose weight. It's only 80 calories. You could have two of those meals a day. I like to throw in a couple of eggs uh, and make it with water. You're only going to get like a 250 calorie meal. So two of those is 500 calories. You're going to have a 300 or 500 calorie meal. You're down below 1,000 calories. And you have all your nutrients. You have all your nutrients, yeah. right? Because you're still going to take your 90 essential right. nutrients. You're going to take your Alex pack, even though you've cut your calories, your portion control is way down here. But you've, you're still taking your 90 essential nutrients, and you're going to lose weight. We see it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's the most dramatic example of how powerful this stuff is, mm -hmm. is the weight loss. Yes. And the weight loss isn't even, shouldn't even necessarily be the target of what you're looking for. That's like an... It like just a, happens. It just happens. Yes. It happens on its own. Now, if somebody needs to lose 25, 50, 75, 100 pounds or more, then we throw in what we call ASAP. I like to add ASAP. Yeah. ASAP is an acronym for as slim as possible. Right. But I like to say ASAP, ASAP, because it's as slim as possible now. as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. now, exactly. <laughs> and so... Um, what I like to do, if you need to lose 50 pounds or less, you put one dropper full under your tongue um, of this liquid, what it is, it's, it's amino acids, which is the raw material for your pituitary to make certain hormones. Like growth hormone. 
No, like HC. Oh, H. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so, don't tell anybody. I won't say anything about that. <laughs> it's a very important hormone. Though. Yeah. And so, um, instead of going and getting prescription injections, right. you do this yourself. Right. And you're going to lose, you know, a quarter of a pound, half a pound, two pounds a day, depending on how you are with that portion control piece, right? And just like you said, Aaron lost 100 pounds. We have thousands of people every I month. I see it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. And I see it around the world. People are just, this product's going around the world now. Yeah. And uh, you but take... Even, but even, they're adding years to their life. They're oh, decreasing yeah. the likelihood of arthritis and degenerative diseases and cancer, God forbid. Cancer, and heart, heart disease. All of that. All of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, it's a combination of the 90 essential nutrients, the Alex pack is a combination of um, the uh, super juices that's in the BTT, the Beyond Tangerine, right. 115 super juices, uh, antioxidants fending off the bad guys. Magnesium? Are, well, it's all in there. Yeah, well, the, osteo, like, the, the osteo FX Plus, we haven't even talked about that one. Yeah. That's a wonderful well, product. Well, it's part the of the Alex pack. Yeah, yeah. It's all in there. And so at any rate, um, obesity goes away very quickly. Um, but when you say, uh, right now they're predicting 50% obesity by the year 2030, that tells you that they don't know what to do. Because if they knew what to do, they'd say, okay, right now we're 36% obesity. It'll be Here's less. what we do. Yeah. And by 2030, it's going to be 20%. They don't know what to do. They have no earthly yeah. idea because their, their theory has failed them. Yeah. And they cannot believe it's a disease of deficiency. And their little pea brains that cannot believe that it's a disease of deficiency. Well, they're still operating that steam engine mentality where you put the coal in and you get a fire. And they don't understand that the body's not a steam engine. There's a whole, it's a, it's a metabolic system. It's yes. a chemistry system. Okay, now. The spin-off of that, of course, they say the people who are obese, they have a higher rate of diabetes. diabetes. Yep. That's, that's his sort of cousin disease here. Right. They run together, but not all the time. You can have people who are obese don't have diabetes, but they do tend to run together. And we've known for 70 years that, uh, that diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which makes up 98% of the diabetic population, is a simple mineral deficiency disease again. It's not genetic in any way, shape, or form. Right. It is not genetic in any way, shape, or form, for emphasis, right? Right. It is a simple mineral deficiency disease, and I have to tell you this story. You will appreciate this, pharmacist, man. There's a fellow out there by the name of Jerry Murphy. He's he's an owner of one of the largest, um, I think it's the third largest um, medical laboratory in America. He services 7,000 hospitals and tens of thousands of doctors' private offices every day with his medical laboratory. This guy's got three it's PhDs. Like a diagnostic, like a diagnostic? Oh, a diagnostic yeah. laboratory. Yeah, they take specimens and yeah. send them to the laboratory. They send the results back to the doctor, right? I mean, this guy has three PhDs, literally, he has three PhDs. He doesn't have in diabetes. Medical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he had terrible, brittle diabetes. I mean, his blood sugar is off the chart, even with injectable insulin. And he his knows age. about all this stuff. Well, he has access to the finest endocrinologist, the cutting wow. edge of research on what you do for diabetes, all the drugs. I mean, he knows everything about diabetes the medical system knows. Well, mutual friend introduces us. And because they've been talking about diabetes for 25, 30 years, right? And so I said, well, yes, sir, I can help you. I can, I can get your A1C hemoglobin down below 5 within a couple of months. I can get your blood sugar down below 100 without medication. You'll be an ex-diabetic. And he looks at me like, oh, yeah, right. right. He says, who are you? <laughs> so I had to introduce myself a little bit. He said, well, I don't believe you. So I'll tell you what, give, you know, give me a test. I mean... Um, give it a try. You have everything to gain, nothing to lose. You're not being successful at what you're doing. He says, okay, I'll give you 90 days, Wallach. He says, if you can get my A1C hemoglobin down from 8.9, down below 5, within 90 days, if you can get my blood sugar consistently down below 100 without medication within 90 days, I'll be your best friend. Wow. I'll fly around my jet plane. I will show up spontaneous at meetings. You won't even know. I'll just appear and give my testimony. I will brag about you. I will put every one of my employees on your program and I'll stop all my that, insurance. And you knew you could do it. You knew you I was self-insure. Well, I've been doing it every day for course, 35 yeah. years. And so he said, but I'll tell you what, if you fail, if in 90 days you haven't gotten rid of my diabetes, I will hire somebody whose only job is to go around every place where you're going to give a talk and tell everybody in the newspapers and interview, be interviewed and tell everybody what a quack you are. Right. I said, okay, Jerry, let's do it. Let's go for it. And he was kind of shocked that I didn't want to negotiate, right, and equivocate. Right. He was, I said, let's do it. Well, to make a long story short, in two months' time, following right. exactly what I told him to do, and he was very good, and he was impeccable in doing exactly what I told him, his A1C hemoglobin dropped from 8.9 down to 4.3, and his blood sugar went down to 62 without medication. That's amazing. And you know what? It's you, the way you put it and the way you, uh, 
frame it, it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy. And I want everybody to understand this is easy. Mm -hmm. If you have diabetes, if you have a blood sugar problem and you've been told you're going to be on insulin the rest of your life and you're going to be on drugs the rest of your life, this is easy because it's a metabolic problem. And once you change your body's chemistry, it can't help but follow. Now, uh, that gets us to what I, my personal favorite product, and you know, we all have our favorite products, but my personal favorite product is the Sweeties. Yes. And that's because... That's the secret sauce. That's the secret sauce, right? For, it's for the type chrom 2 diabetes. The chromium and the vanadium, and these two minerals are so amazing for blood sugar. Real quick, if you could just tell the listeners a little bit about chrom chromium, especially, but a little bit about vanadium. Well, these two minerals have been known, again, for 70 years to... Uh, support your body's ability to metabolize carbohydrates and fats and, and sugars at the cellular level. Support healthy blood sugar by sensitizing your cell membranes to insulin. That's what they do. They're, they're sort of the cofactor necessary so your cell wall can recognize insulin. Right. So it can speak the language of insulin. People who have type 2 diabetes, contrary to what doctors tell their patients, when you have type 2 diabetes, you're making as much as 10 times more insulin than a non-diabetic. resistance to the insulin. Exactly. So the insulin level is going up because your body keeps trying, right. keeps pumping out more, saying, why aren't you responding? Well, that's because you're missing that key. It's, it's kind of like the combination uh, on a combination lock. And if you take this along with the 90 essential nutrients, right. by themselves, you'll get okay results. But if you take those two by themselves, you'll be unhappy. You say, well, that Wallach thing didn't work. You must take them along with the 90 essential nutrients. The B nutrients. vitamins, the vitamin C. And all 90 yeah, essential magnesium, nutrients. Magnesium, right, right, right. All ni the amino acids, I mean everything. You yeah. cannot do it in an isolated that's way. That's right, that's right. Okay? I don't want to get people get the impression they can just take those two minerals yes. and their diabetes is going to win. No, right. no, no. Those are the secret sauce that goes along with the basic program, and then it will work every time. There's, that, actually, there's actually a component in the body called the glucose tolerance factor, which mm -hmm. chromium and, and I, I think vanadium might be part are of. Are part of, yes. Are part of that glucose tolerance yeah. factor. But then it's, it's something your body puts together when you have those nutrients, right? Just like your bones. What's, what's the secret sauce for bones? Well, minerals, including phosphorus and calcium not, and not just calcium. magnesium. Well, no, your bones require all 90 essential all nutrients. All 90 essential nutrients. Exactly. Nutrients. So if you just take calcium, you'll still get osteoporosis and fractures and arthritis. That's such an mm. important point. You can't say that enough. It is the entire spectrum of mm. essential nutrients. And that's why the term, the mighty 90, is so important. It's not just one nutrient. As important as chromium is and as important as vanadium is and as important as calcium is, it's the entire spectrum of nutrients that you need. You cannot make an angel food cake. Yeah. With McCormick's liquid vanilla extract by itself. Right. You can get an angel food crepe, as you said. Well, you wouldn't even get a crepe, but just the, yeah. or the extract, right? But um, nobody, um, we, can, we can make a town diabetes-free in 60 days. Isn't that amazing? We diabetes can. is probably one of the easiest things to, yes. one of the easiest things to reverse. And you know what's interesting is you could be a hero so fast when mm -hmm. you tell, when you get people like like this guy you're talking about, Jerry, mm -hmm. you can be a hero so fast simply by putting people on these these yeah. kinds of essential nutrients. And how many people, how much death and destruction and, dis, uh, and just nightmares does something like diabetes cause in this country? Well, next obesity is the biggest single cost factor in medicine today. One third of Americans, 30% of Americans, have type 2 diabetes. And how many pre diabetics? Well, that's scary, isn't it? Right. Another one third. Right. So you're talking two thirds of a country that spends more money than any all other. No, no, all nations combined. Combined, right? Yeah. We are the we are, we spend more money than any other country in the history of the planet. All nations combined, not any country. All nations ever in history, and we are the sickest culture in the history That's of the right. planet. And something as simple as supplementing with nutrition, making sure that you're eating correctly, staying away from the bad things, staying away from the bad things can make such a huge difference. It's been such an honor to talk to you. I can't even tell you, Doc. Well, thank, thank you, you so so I much. It. Thank you for uh, not just for me. Well, thank you on behalf of everybody that you've touched and everybody whose lives you've improved, everybody whose lives you've changed. You're just an amazing, amazing, amazing human being, and it's a pleasure. Well, I appreciate honor. you, thank Pharmacist you. Ben. There. I really appreciate you because 15 years ago Don't you came to me. Don't tell about my pants. Don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> you came to me and you said, I, "I really want to learn from you how to use nutrition to help my patients and people I know," and you kept your word, and I'm very proud of you for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure and an honor. I'm Pharmacist Ben, Doc Wallach. Thanks a lot, yeah, buddy. Thank you. We'll talk again. <laughs>